we will continue with the Christmas story. Today's story is called The Professor and the Birds. And that, ladies and gentlemen, tells the true story of what Christmas is all about. It's a fable, a fictional story, a myth based on false beliefs, Professor Ray stated. The story of a higher power, or God. Coming to Earth as a man can't happen, didn't happen, and makes no sense. Why would a powerful God need to do that? Those that believe it expect you to believe it based on faith alone, not facts, he explained. I prefer the factual, the concrete, the observable universe instead of the fictional faith-based storytellers, he said in summation. I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight, Christmas Eve for my truth about Christmas lecture, he added. I'll end it tonight, not with a, a Merry Christmases, but rather with a more appropriate Happy Holidays. Good evening, he concluded. The 20 or so people in attendance quickly exited the small auditorium. Soon after, Professor Ray locked the doors and left. As he walked to his car, the wind picked up and snow flurries began to fall. The drive home was uneventful except for the traffic jam caused by parishioners waiting to enter a church parking lot for a Christmas Eve service. If these people only knew the truth, he thought loud as he slowly passed the church. Minutes later, he pulled into his driveway, opened the garage door, parked his car, and went inside to the warmer confines of his house. After a light dinner, Professor Ray went over to the large living room window and noticed that the snowfall was getting heavier. He settled into his easy chair in the living room next to the fireplace. Time to catch up on some of my science journals. He decided as he opened up one of the magazines to an article titled Rewriting the Axioms of Quantum Theory. After a few pages of reading, he glanced up at the living room window and noticed the snowfall was now the heaviest it had been all evening. Not long after he returned to his journal, he was startled by a loud popping sound in the direction of the window. Then another pop, a thud, and yet another muddled pop. He quickly got up and went to the window to investigate. At first he thought that maybe someone was throwing snowballs at his window. Turning on the outside lights and looking around, he saw something unexpected. A flock of birds was huddled miserably in the snow on the ground. They must have flown into the window during the snowstorm, he figured. Well, I can't let these poor birds freeze out there. Let me see what I can do for them, he decided. The professor put on his coat and boots and went outside. He tried catching the birds. But when he got too close, they would flutter away. He tried approaching them very slowly, but once again, when he got too close, they scattered. Hmm. He looked around, thinking about what he could do. Noticing the garage, he had an idea. After opening the garage door, he backed his car out and parked it in the driveway, with the light on and a small portable heater now going in the garage. He figured that should provide a nice warm temporary place for the birds. That should do it. All I have to do is get the birds to go into the garage. She smiled with confidence. He went back to where the birds were and tried to coax them in the direction of the garage. The birds just did not want to go in the direction he wanted. He tried shooing them in. He tried walking around and waving his arms and gesturing to them. The birds scattered in every direction, every direction except toward the open and safe garage. What else can I do? He questioned. Any move I make seems to frighten them away? I think I know the answer. Food will entice them in. He reasoned. He went back into the house and returned with a few slices of bread that he broke up into smaller pieces. He sprinkled the pieces of bread in a line leading to the warm, lighted, wide open garage. But still, the birds did not go in. They ignored the bread trail. I don't get it, he thought out loud. I'm not trying to hurt them, I'm trying to help them. But I guess they don't know that, he sighed. They must be afraid of me, he realized. To them, I probably seem like a giant and powerful and terrifying creature. Someone they don't trust and someone they don't understand. He spent a few moments pondering the situation. If only I could be a bird, he thought. I could walk among them, speak their language and tell them that they could trust me. And if they would do what I suggested, they would be safe and okay. 
If I could tell them that I wanted to help them and that I was not going to hurt them. He reasoned. But to do that, he paused with a sigh. To do that, I would have to become one of them so that they could see and hear and understand. The snowfall had now stopped and Professor Ray stood there, silent, looking down at the birds. Moments later, church bells began to ring in the distance. He stood there listening to the bells, Aedis Thiefidels, listening to the bells pealing the glad tidings of Christmas. As the bells continued to echo the true story of Christmas, he sank to his knees in the snow. God will bless you. We will continue with the Christmas story. Today's story is called Christmas Paws. It was a cold Christmas Eve and the spirit of the season seemed so distant. Justin and Julie were returning from the vet clinic, having made the awful decision to put their beloved dog of 14 years, Banjo, to sleep. The cancer had depleted Banjo's frail body. Wow. It's so quiet now. Julie noticed as she walked in the house. I know, just inside. This is just so sad, Christmas without Banjo. I don't feel like going to the Christmas party tonight, Julie said with tears in her eyes. This is terrible. I don't know if we did the right thing at the vet. Banjo is gone forever now. No Christmas party for me either. Justin added in a somber tone. Both Justin and Julie, worn out from the emotion of the day, sat down on the sofa and began watching It's a Wonderful Life on TV. Words were not necessary as visual reminders in the room. Banjo's dog bed, a dog toy, and photo frames with pictures of Banjo emphasized the void that was now surrounding them toward the end of the movie. Both Justin and Julie fell asleep as the cold wind picked up outside, creating a howling sound at times. The night continued as the wind grew even stronger and the temperature fell. Shortly after midnight, Julie's eyes opened, hearing the faint sounds of barking in the distance. She got up and went to the front door. Upon opening the door, she was startled to see that not only was it light outside, but it was also pleasantly warm. What is going on? In front of her was a vast expanse of green grass, trees, flowers, a flowing stream, and a multitude of animals. There were dogs, cats, bunnies, birds, chickens, and even a few pigs. More animals were off in the distance that she couldn't quite make out what they were. She stepped out of the doorway. It was as if something were calling her to come forward, without words, into an apparent surreal paradise. Julie exited her porch and walked down to the pristine white sidewalk that curved its way to the horizon. Is this a dream? She asked herself. No, I really feel like I'm here. It can't be real, can it? As she walked along the sidewalk, a couple of squirrels approached and looked up at her. Hi, she said. Although the squirrels did not make a sound, Julie felt a welcome and a hello from them. She was at peace with them and they were at peace with her. I guess I should be afraid of all this, but I am not. Julie realized as she continued her journey along the sidewalk. Looking to her left, she saw some kittens and older cats playing. Some were chasing their tails and some were jumping around as if they did not have a care in the world. And off to the right, there were a few puppies rolling around in the soft green grass. Up ahead, there were dogs, cats, and even some guinea pigs playing together. An iguana crawled across the sidewalk, and for some reason Julie knew that the iguana was happy and had a sense of purpose in this place. A chihuahua ran up to Julie with what sounded like a happy bark. Bark, bark. She picked up the chihuahua and was then the subject of several puppy kisses. Putting the chihuahua down, she noticed he went ahead a few steps and then turned his head around as if to say, follow me. He led the way. After a minute or so, Julie stopped and noticed a medium-sized black Labrador retriever with a white spot on its face running in her direction. I know that dog, she recognized. The black Labrador reached her and began licking her hand. Oh, wow. She sighed with concern. This is the poor dog I saw yesterday laying on the side of the road that was hit by a car and killed. 
I stopped to help a lady put her into the car so she could go bury her. I know this is her because I remember that white spot on her face. Julie noticed a park bench nearby and decided to sit for a moment. Another dog, this one much smaller with gray coat, ran up and jumped into Julie's lap. I know you too, Julie teared up. I found you one day when I was going to work. You couldn't walk and you were barely alive. After I got you to the vet, they said you had two broken legs and a broken back. There was nothing they could do and they had to put you to sleep. I never forgot you. Julie spoke softly as she hugged the small dog. The black Labrador turned and walked down the sidewalk in the direction she came from. The small dog jumped from Julie's lap and joined the black Labrador. Both dogs turned their heads back to look at Julie and issued inviting box. You want me to come with you, don't you? Julie spoke out loud. The black Labrador responded favorably with another bark. After following the two dogs for a few minutes over a small hill, she could see what looked like the light of a bright, but setting sun on the horizon at the end of the sidewalk off in the distance. As she strolled further down the sidewalk path, Julie looked around in continuing amazement. I have never seen so many animals so happy and so friendly, she thought. There is excitement in the air, yet it is so peaceful. She smiled. A short time later, she noticed a medium-sized mutt dog off in the distance running across the meadow toward her as fast as the dog's feet would go. I don't believe it, Julie said in awe. It's Banjo. With tears in her eyes, she ran into the green grass toward Banjo. She sank to her knees and took Banjo into her arms for hugs and puppy kisses. It's you. Banjo, it's you. The happy reunion lasted for several minutes. Banjo then calmed down a bit and settled in next to Julie, encouraging the petting they had often done on the sofa at home. Banjo, panting with tongue hanging out, seemed to be smiling with a message for Julie. Julie felt a wonderful sense of peace and understanding in reconnecting with Banjo. Several thoughts came to her reality. Banjo, you are telling me thank you for doing the right thing at the vet. Letting you go and ending your pain, Julie realized. Banjo looked up with a sense of approval. You are also telling me that one day when it is time, we will walk the sidewalk together into the light. Tears of joy flowed freely. Julie looked around at all the other animals as other thoughts came over her. And all of the animals that are here and were homeless or abused or neglected or put to sleep too soon, we will be given some of them to take with us. And all of the animals in this entire place will be able to take that walk with someone at the right time. No more pain, no more suffering, no more starving, just joy. Julie sat down and then laid back in the grass with Banjo's head on her stomach. She looked up at the blue sky and saw a puffy white cloud in the shape of a paw print. With tears of understanding in her heart, she fell asleep next to Banjo. Time passed and Julie later awoke and noticed that she was now at home on the sofa with morning sunlight streaming through the front windows. Julie got up in a state of peaceful wonderment and went to the front door. She opened the door and noticed Justin sitting on the front steps. She sat down beside him and they looked at each other. Justin spoke first. You are not going to believe the dream I think I had. It was cool. Julie put her finger up to his mouth to silence him. I believe Julie said. They both looked up in the blue sky and off in the distance they saw two puffy white clouds in the shape of two paw prints. Christmas paws, Julie said. It's a sign, Justin added. After a few moments of reflection, they knew that this Christmas, which had started with such sadness and despair, had become a Christmas of hope and comfort and meaning.